If you've followed my channel for a long time, you probably know that I like sending video signals long distances. I also like fiber a lot. Those are some two favorite things of mine. Partly because I got this whole personal data center obsession going on, trying to put all my computers down here in the basement where they can chill out, etc. But part of that means sending video to all of my displays through the walls of the house. And HDMI is really quite terrible for pulling through the walls. That's why today I am super happy to take a look at these little guys here. Now these little guys let me send HDMI 2.0 long distances using ordinary multi-mode fiber. And not just ordinary fiber, one single strand multi-mode fiber with an LC connector on the end. This is very tiny. You can fit this through a lot of places that an HDMI, even a mini HDMI, would not fit. So also this is completely standard networking fiber. So of course the home AV industry likes to make their own standards. That's why we have all the shit from them like active optical cables and little mini HDMI adapters and all that junk. But in the optical networking world for ethernet and other standards like that, using multi-mode fiber like this has been around for a long time. It's really easy to get. Cables like this only cost a few dollars. If you want to install one in your house where you're building it, you can buy them pre-made to length. Super easy to go. Easy way to get into fiber. So if sending HDMI over these tiny little multi-mode fibers through your house sounds like something you're interested in, then come along on this adventure. Also, before I get into this video, I just launched a merch store. So if you wanna buy a shirt like this one, Home Lab, your own personal data center, or several of my other designs, designed by myself and my fiance, Rena, we would love for you to hop down to my Kofi link in the description below, and check those out. So without further ado, let's see what we got in the box. Well, they sent me two of these guys, one is HDMI 2.0, and one is HDMI 1.4. So I'm pretty sure they're exactly identical, so I guess we'll open the 2.0 one first. So we got some instructions, who needs that? And the units themselves. Now these guys are really quite tiny here. So on the back, if I pull the thing out, so we've got the fiber slot, you can look in there. We've also got power with a micro USB, so not a type C, sorry. This one says R1N, so the green side must be the receiver. Yep, because it says HDMI out. We've of course got an HDMI. So the orange one must be the transmitter. Transmitter side, we again have micro USB and the ferrule that accepts the LC connector. So pretty simple. And we've also got two micro USB cables and that's it. So before I do some thorough testing, I'm just gonna do a quick demo here. Now these guys are specified to work with multi-mode fiber, OM3, OM4. That's the aqua stuff. So I got this here. Now they only need one single fiber, but I actually don't own any one single fibers in multi-mode. So I've just got a duplex here and I just split the two ends. So I'm just gonna use one of them today. Orange side, that's the transmitter for my laptop. So I'll just take my fiber, take the dust caps off, get that guy plugged in here. I'm also going to need power from the micro USB. And over on my laptop, all I've got is a type C. So I'll need a hub here. Thankfully I have this hub that has HDMI and USB. So you can plug USB in, HDMI in, plug this whole thing into the laptop. That side's ready. Now for the other side, I'm again going to need power. So I'll take my desk caps off. So we got this strand going in there. And I'll reach around and plug this in. And of course, link came right up. Told my laptop to use it as an external monitor and in case anyone is curious about frame rate, this thing should handle the full HDMI 2.0 bandwidth. So not 2.1, but 2.0. They have another version that handles a lower bandwidth HDMI 1.4, but this is perfectly fine for 1080p 60, obviously. There should be zero latency here because we're just taking the electrical signal on the HDMI, converting it to photons on the fiber, and then converting it back. We're not doing any encoding or something like that. Like some of the Ethernet-based solutions that are compressing the video, sending it over like H.265 and decompressing it. This is just sending it as different wavelengths of light. So, I mean, I guess I could do a high-speed camera test just to prove that. So this is the Blur Busters flicker test. It flickers back and forth between two colors. I'm flickering it at one hertz now, so you guys don't have like a seizure. Um, but I actually run it at 60 hertz. The iPhone camera can film it. It puts a number on the screen of what frame it's on. 
So I flip this over to 60 hertz. Um, I guess I'll look away now. Wow, that's hard to look at on the eyes. Yeah, it looks pretty identical to me. Now, of course, I would expect this to be identical. I'd be very concerned if it wasn't, because I'm expecting this to just take the raw high-speed differential signals on the HDMI connector, encode them as photons, decode them as photons. So it should only be doing like high-speed analog processing. It shouldn't be actually taking in the image and doing anything with the image. And it appears that it's not, so good job on that. By the way, if you want to see how some of the like older uh, active HDMI cables work, that have built-in optics but aren't fully fiber optic like this. There's a really great video up here that I'll link to from the signal path. He tears down one of those. He's a really, really good expert on high-speed stuff like this, so check out his video. So next test I'm down here. I wanted to see if I could get these guys to work with single-mode fiber. Now, they're not advertised to support single-mode fiber. They're advertised to require multi-mode fiber, such as OM3, OM4, this aqua stuff. This is a 50 micron diameter glass core. Um, basically, the light bounces differently in multi-mode fiber than single-mode fiber as it reflects back and forth. They're different. So, I have a lot of single-mode fiber for a variety of reasons. This is yellow stuff, OS2. This is a 9 micron core. So, I have this run through my house upstairs. I was hoping to run a test with that. I have some very long single-modes that I can run outside. I have some outdoor rated cable, that kind of stuff. So, when you do those kinds of things, single-mode is much easier to find and to work with because pretty universally, once you go outdoors, you're pretty much using single mode. Just because you're generally going longer distances, and multi-mode can only go for about three, 400 meters. Now, 400 meters probably sounds fantastic to you guys at home, but to networking people, that's nothing. So, anyway, I tried this single mode patch cable on its own with these adapters here, and I got nothing. So next, I bought some mode conditioning patch cables. These have a little splice in them that does some sort of adaption. These were not particularly common. They used to be used with a type of transceiver called an LRM back in the gigabit days to run LR transceivers slightly longer distances over multi-mode, whatever. So anyway, I have a set of these. I'm going multi-mode to single mode and then back to multi-mode and I got nothing again. But it's starting to come through. You can see flickers. Most of the time the monitor says out of range. Occasionally if I take my laptop out of sleep mode, you'll see like the picture flash for a second as the signal comes through all the way. But it's clearly not happy with this. so. Multi-mode it is, as it said it required, but if you're installing this in your wall, it's another reason that you might want to prefer multi-mode over single mode at home. Again, normally I preach single mode everywhere because it's easier just to have one set of stuff than to use single mode, multi-mode. Um, if you're doing like 100 gigabit fast, fast stuff, you'll pretty much need single mode. Or you need the eight-way MPO multi-mode, which this is not. But you have options for what to install in your house. Multi-mode is perfectly fine up to 25 gig with duplex like this. If you do MPO, you can do eight of these HDMI adapters if you wanted, or you could do 100 gig, or you could do eight, um, like, you got a lot of options. Okay, so out with my old test monitor, I got a new monitor I borrowed from somewhere else. This guy's 1440p and I think 144 hertz he can do. So this is much higher bandwidth than HDMI 1.4 of the adapter I've been testing or 2.0 of the other adapter. So I'm going to see where I can find limits of these guys for bandwidth. So since this display in HDMI 2.0 will exceed the limits of my MacBook, I got out a mini PC here. It's just one I had on the shelf. It's got a Ryzen 7000 series APU that should be able to do 1440p, 144Hz, I think. So because I'm not using my usual capture setup, I have a real keyboard and a real mouse. I'm again going to start with the HDMI 1.4 adapters to see what their limit is. So let's get out some fiber and let's get this guy running. Okay, let's boot this guy up, see what we got going on. Into Windows, unfortunately. So I got this guy hooked up with a plain HDMI cable and in Windows, he shows up as a Q32G2 WG3 at 1440p 60 hertz with the option to run up to 144. And if I pick 144, it lets me do it. Let's see about the other bus test. test. Now remember, this is not with a fiber, this is just with a plain HDMI cable. So this mini PC and this display can do up to 144 hertz and 1440p. And they are doing that over plain HDMI. 
So now, I'm going to plug the fiber in, we'll see what that looks like. Okay, what do we got now? Um, now we got 60 FPS and I look way smaller. So now it shows up as Display 1 AFA 4K and my options for resolution, it's defaulting to 1080p at 60 hertz. What can I force it to? Let's try forcing it to 1440 and we get input not support. So clearly the input did support it with a plain cable, but not with this HDMI one. Now again, this is the HDMI 1.4 dongle that's slightly cheaper. So I'm gonna switch out to the slightly more expensive HDMI 2.0 version to see if that one can do this. So now I've got the HDMI 2.0 sender and the 1.4 receiver and I got nothing. So there's some sort of incompatibility there between these two dongles. So I got to keep them separate. Okay, we got it. There we go. Okay, so now it's working at 1440p at least with the 2.0 dongle. It shows up again as the Q32G2WG3. That's nice. Um, and it's doing 144 hertz, okay. So that's what I expected to be capable of with HDMI 2.0. And the 2.0 dongle did it fine. 1.4 and did not. Again, we expected that, but the behavior was a little bit weird and that it didn't show up as the right EDID. So I'm not sure if they're limiting EDID when the EDID support is too high or something like that. I don't know, but the 2.0 dongle is working fine. So following up on the weird EDID behavior of the HDMI 1.4 version, I plugged it back into my old monitor, which can definitely not exceed 1.4. And it again shows up as an AFA 4K as the model. So it's not passing through EDID information with the 1.4 version. The 2.0 version was correctly though. I know you guys probably can't see this super well, but I can set resolutions all the way up to 4K here, which is well beyond what my display supports. So I am now really curious what's inside these guys. So I'm gonna to try to take one of my sets apart. So come along for that. Got the iFixit toolkit. So taking a look at these guys, I am not really sure how to open them. So looking at the bottom, there's clearly like a split line here, you can see in the glare, between the two different pieces of the housing. Not sure if this is ultrasonic welded or if this is just friction fit or what, but there are no apparent fasteners that I can see. So I'm gonna have to pry it open. And then obviously same thing with the other side, they look pretty much identical. So in my iFixit toolkit here, I do have a super nice tool here. I'm gonna try a small screwdriver. Let's see how this does. Mm, nope, that's not looking very good. Can I get anything in here? Nope. Maybe the connector area. Is there any sort of screw holes that it might be under some sort of sticker here? We can find. These are very hard. They might be metal, which might be why I'm having such a hard time forcing my way in with these tools. Yeah, so if you can see there, as I'm scraping the paint off here, this bottom piece is metal. I think the top piece is two. So how would they assemble this? These are both die cast. Okay, new strategy. I push this in here and I try to pop the die castings apart and I got this one open. Oh, come on. There we go. Okay, so this is a die casting. The other side is also a die casting. And in the center we have this. Which one was I looking at before? I was looking at the transmitter. So here is our optic module. We have power coming in here. If we take a look at this real close, you can see there's literally nothing that's not under this EMI shield. Back side, we got a single chip Trying to read the name on it, but I can't see if I can read it. ST Microelectronics. I recognize that logo. Aim this around for you guys to have a good reading. So this is the transmitter. If I scrape off this QR code here, you can see it says A1TXV1.1. So I guess same for the receiver. We'll pop a screwdriver in here. And there we go, got that, same 
die cast case. It's just painted orange this time. Painted green instead of orange. This board is green. Oh, nice color coding. The green enclosure, the green board. This time we got nothing on the back side, so it all must be on the front side. And actually, we've got nothing at all. So on this side, we have A1RX. Let's scrape this label off again. A1, come on, focus. A1RX V1. On the back side, I've got four passives. It's like two resistors and two capacitors to me, I think. Focus. And then obviously we've got the optical module. So I think you guys know I probably got to take this optical module off, don't I? All right, guys, I got my soldering iron out. It might surprise you to know I'm actually not like qualified to solder microelectronics. I have designed them before, but making them myself is not really my thing. So this is the soldering iron I have. It's kind of big, but we'll see what we can do. Easy to keep track of these guys because one's red and one's green. So I guess we'll do the green one first because everything is hiding out under here. So I've got this pair of reverse tweezers I'm going to use to hold the board. So I'm going to do this, and then I've got a pair of regular tweezers I'm going to try to use to pull this guy off. So I've encountered a slight problem here. These guys are potted, so if I look here, you can see just a little bit of goo spilling out. Same on this one. So I'm expecting this is fully glued down. I cannot pry these guys off, which is why I think they're filled with epoxy, which I guess makes sense, so this is where I'm going to stop my teardown. Okay, so getting back from the teardown here, I got my parts here. I got the other modules here that are fully assembled. What do I think about these guys? So if you follow my channel for a long time, you've probably seen my video, I'll link to it up here, where I sent HDMI 2.1, 48 gigabits, over multi-mode fiber. Now that adapter, I still have, it still works very well. That requires seven strands of fiber, so an eight-way MPO connector that's quite a bit larger than one of these LCs. It's also much less likely to be in your wall. I mean, not that this fiber is likely to be in your wall either, but pulling an eight-way MPO for every display is kind of a lot of fiber to pull. Now, of course, it's worth it. You get HDMI 2.1, very high bandwidth stuff. But I think most of you probably don't need 2.1, and 2.0 that these guys do is probably acceptable for you, in which case, if you have the MPO already, you can run eight of these over it with a fan-out cable. Although I did hear from some people that the cable that Rupro shipped in that last video only actually had seven strands populated. If you bought it from like fs.com, it would have all eight, obviously. I've also looked at solutions in the past that send video over ethernet. And these also work very well for very different use cases. It's so like, for example, if you need to look at a monitor remotely, if you need to multicast one to many, that's a great place where ethernet helps you. I use them when I do like live events. I can hook up cameras all around the building um, using the facilities networking without having to run extra fiber, things like that. That's what I've done for robotics events, stuff like that. So I'm using them for low speed displays. They get fine quality at 1080p. It is compressed with H.265 on those units. These units here are not compressed. So these I think feel, fill a nice niche in between the highest of the high end MPO 8 fiber HDMI 2.1 and something more basic, like sending it over Ethernet. So I'm pretty happy with these. I have not had any issues with them. I'll have a link down below for where to buy these. Um, also a reminder, I launched my merch store today. So if you like the your own personal data center home lab shirt, as well as several other fine designs I have, check out my Kofi link down below for that as well. I also have a Discord server. You can chat with me in Discord. Always appreciate that. I'm on Mastodon. If you like following people on Mastodon, link down below for that as well. And as always, I'll see you guys on the next adventure.